Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Prime Comments. And we've really shortened down the comments this week. In fact, I'm only looking at three different videos. So three to four of your comments. I'm trying to condense it this week. One, because I have a really tight schedule here on Sunday because I'm heading to a movie today. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to go to the new Justice League movie or if I am heading over, out to see the new Thor movie. I knew the, North, I, I, like the new Thor movie is higher <laughs> reviewed, higher rated than the Justice League movie, but I kind of want to see them both. I have time to go to one, and so the rest of the time I am spending with you guys because earlier today I watched the, the Packer game. Yes, I'm aware the Packers lost. Got shut out at Lambeau first time since 2006. Blah, blah, blah. You guys don't care about that. Let's get into your comments this week. So this comment comes from the Black Friday Switch sales, third parties, and 2018 lineup, which ended up being our Nintendo Prime Podcast episode 39. Uh, and this comment comes from David Brown. 20 bucks to get on the podcast? That's lame. Please give us money. Please, please, please. I'll let you put it in my arse for 50 bucks. Please, please, money, please. For the love of all that is holy, money! 20 bucks, you get three seconds on our podcast. I responded to David Brown, and I said, we're not begging anyone. And we aren't requiring anyone give anything at all. The tier exists by request. It's not even our idea. Also, do you know any other podcasts that just lets their fans come on the actual podcast? Because I don't. And David Brown responded, you're begging whether you think so or not. So obviously, I wanted to bring this up because it, it's not a common thought process, right? There's not a lot of people out there that are complaining about our Patreon. It's really weird. Uh, we used to get early complaints about our Patreon like six months ago. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't really understand why people have complaints about things like Patreon or the 20 bucks to get on the podcast or like like the, like this, please give us money, money, please, please, please. I've never like begged like, literally beg for money. All I've ever done, or at least all I ever tried to do, is mention that we have a Patreon and that we have tiers at the Patreon, and it's a way you could show us support. I've never said, hey, if you don't support us on Patreon, we're going away. Our channel's canceled. If you don't support us on Patreon, there is no Nintendo Prime podcast. Uh, I just mention it as a way of supporting us, and if you support us, you we give you rewards for supporting us, and one of those rewards is being on our podcast, and it's really weird, like when he says 20 bucks gets you three seconds, our average podcast is two to three hours long, um, and if you look at the two podcasts, we've had two podcasts so far that have had our $20 tier guests on, and they got to talk a lot, uh, like a lot, a lot, a lot, it wasn't... I know, you know, some of this is a criticism of me cutting people off, uh, but that didn't happen in those podcasts. I literally, those people, I mean, I was getting cut off. The last pers person we had on uh, was another guy named Nathan, and uh, he happens to also be kind of an independent developer, and he he was cutting me off, <laughs> which I said, hey, no, he like even apologized during the podcast. Like, Don't apologize. That's what I'm guilty of doing all the time. Cut me off and get your words in. Um, and he had a lot to say, and so did our prior guest before that. So, yeah, it's it's definitely not something that, I don't know, I guess I don't view it as begging. I don't Telling people that there's a way to support us and people choosing to support us is nice, uh, but it's not a requirement, and I'm not, I don't know. I, I don't know. I guess when I view begging... You know, I even looked up the definition of begging to, to see if that's actually what I'm doing. And so by literal definition, you're correct. And you're not because I'm not asking for charity. Uh, I'm asking for people who would like to support us monetarily to do so. And here's a method that gives you something in return. In fact, I promote our Patreon as a better way to do that versus people giving like super chats or subscribing to our channel. Because if you go to our Patreon, you're, you're not... It's not charity at our Patreon. It's premium content. You are paying for access to content that you wouldn't get otherwise. As an example, for $5 a month on our Patreon, you get early access to our podcast. You are paying a premium to have early access to our podcast. You're paying to get something in return. That's why I don't really view it as begging. Begging would be like, if you don't support us, we are going away. That is not, that's not even remotely true. Uh, Patreon is a supplementary 
uh, income that obviously helps keep what we do here going and helps us launch new shows, but it's not necessarily uh, the driving factor. Like Most of our, our primary source of income is YouTube ads, and will probably always be YouTube ads, but Patreon is just a nice way to supplement that because, hey, uh, with, I, I don't know about the whole Adpocalypse thing because we weren't really making money before Adpocalypse anyways. So I don't really understand any of that, like all the channels that lost making money. But what I, what I understand it as is it allows us to do things that don't rely on ad revenue as much. As an example, uh, one podcast per week uh, could take up to 12 to 15 hours worth of research, uh, gathering people, recording, transferring files, and editing uh, for just one video. And that one video is not going to make remotely enough money uh, through just ads to really support doing that kind of video every single week. Now, we've been doing that kind of video every other week anyways, but now thanks to Patreon support, it is weekly. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess I just don't view it as begging. Um, and I'm sorry that you feel 20 bucks is too much, uh, but... We have to limit how many people can be on our podcast every single uh, month because otherwise we end up with a podcast where it's just a slew of fans and I'm not able to bring in special guests and other YouTubers in. Uh, and you always have to worry about, you know, when you bring fans in, they might not be as good at communicating. Uh, so they might just sit there and not talk the whole podcast because they're too nervous. Yeah, it's weird. Like even at, at the $20 tier, we limit it to just 10 people. And as of the recording of this, this prime comment segment, uh, we already have six of those ten slots gone in just like three months, uh, which is amazing. I never thought we'd even get one $20 backer, let alone six. In fact, it is our second most popular backer tier behind the $5 early access tier. Uh, we have a couple $3 backers and some $10 backers as well. But again, people are paying to get something in return. So yeah, I, I guess I don't... Uh, I don't really understand the the begging aspect. We're not a charity. Uh, we're not uh, acting like we're not going to exist without this money. Um, it, it's just supplementary income. It, it's a premium service people are paying for. So I I don't get it. Anyways, let's move on. I'm sure you guys, you know, if you guys have any feedback too as well to improve our Patreon um, and all that stuff, let me know in the comments below because uh, I obviously want to constantly improve it and make it something you guys actually care about. In fact, as I mentioned to the guy, the $20 tier was actually suggested by people uh, as something that they wanted. And clearly, with six people supporting it, it was something that was desired. So, I don't know. I like listening to your feedback. I will give you what you want on the Patreon. If, if uh, Like, say you want to support us if there's a tier that does this. Um, let me know, and I will try to implement that in some way. Moving on, the next comment we're going to talk about uh, comes from the Nintendo Bites Back Against Releasing Games Before Street Date video from this past week. And you said, wing like a bird swing. <laughs> or win like a bird's wing. I, I, I'm not sure which way he meant that to be read. Uh, he said this, This is nothing honorable from the Nintendo indie game shops are struggling, and who cares if the game is sold early? Nintendo should just simply force an online authorization system so no one but approved special previewers can play the game prior to release date. One, think about what you're asking. You're asking Nintendo to put DRM on their system. You're telling Nintendo that you want to make the Switch an always online system, which it can't be because the Switch is an on-the-go system in the first place, and you're asking for DRM, which actually hurts people who legitimately buy copies of games when their internet goes out, when the connection drops to the Nintendo online system, uh, and kicks them out of, you know, say they're playing a nice, uh, you know, they're in their 350th hour of Breath of the Wild, and they're just having a blast, all of a sudden, a uh, hiccup happens in the connection, and it kicks you out, and you might not have got a save in when you wanted to get a save in. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not a good, it's not good. P there are companies that do this uh, to try to combat piracy on PC, and it ends up really, really hurting legit customers. Heck of a lot more than it actually stops piracy, because piracy, it always finds a way. So, yeah, um... As for hurting indie game shops, the revenue that game shops make off brand new games is like razor thin. Uh, they really do not make much revenue. They really rely on people uh, coming in and buying other stuff. So the reason that an indie shop would uh, 
release a game early isn't to make money off that game. It's to get people to come into their shop and hopefully buy other things. This is a gas station effect. Uh, gas stations make very little money off the actual gas. Their goal is that you will come into the store and buy some stuff in the store, and that's where they make their big bank. Same is true with GameStop. Like when they do those midnight releases, uh, it's not really to their benefit in terms of the games because their their margins on those games are razor thin. It's when you come in, they're hoping that you pick up some swag and some other items, some guidebooks and all this stuff along with the game at midnight, and that's going to make GameStop additional revenue. Uh, so, yeah, that's, it, it's really weird. Um, it's also really weird to say, like, who cares if a game is sold early? A lot of people care because it's unfair. And I know, I know, life isn't fair. I get that. But in the case of game releases, uh, it should be. Because if Nintendo says Super Mario Odyssey is coming out on October 27th and an indie game shop gets their shipment on October 20th and they're like, hey, we got the game, let's put it on store shelves, that's not fair to anybody else. And on top of that, all that content is going to get leaked. The, the, the game itself could get leaked online in the form of a ROM. Uh, the game is going to get dumped. Uh, and all this stuff might happen anyways from the media, but at least then N Nintendo can narrow it down to the media. All Nintendo is really doing here is doing the logical thing. They are in Europe uh, making sure the shipments don't get sent out to retailers until closer to actual street date. So you don't end up with a retailer that gets a game a week or two early and has to hold on to it and gets rid of the temptation to put it out early in order to entice people to come to the store and hopefully buy other products besides that game. Um, yeah, it, as for indie shops, you know, struggling. Obviously, uh, mom and pop shops have always struggled, even like way back in the 80s and 90s. You know, it was never a for sure thing. Uh, but there's several that thrive and at least in the united states and they thrive because they find a way to attract customers in uh that isn't necessarily built around always having the new games now do they have some of the new games sure but that's not really their demographic uh the, their system repairs for cheap uh that they often do uh there's undercutting places like gamestop on pricing on, on games that helps attract people in there's running game tournaments that's a big one i know uh, one local uh, mom and pop shop here that's been around for almost 15 years uh, because they are one of the few places around here that run game tournaments with cash prizes. And that gets people in. That gets people spending money. Uh, they have a little snack bar. You buy the snacks. They make money off of that while you're at the tournament. Uh, the, you got to be really smart about this stuff. Uh, and, yeah, mom and pop shops just need to evolve. If that's It's the same way like comic book stores started like dabbling in like D&D &D and video games and stuff like because they realized the physical medium of buying comics is kind of dwindling. Um, and so they are evolving to, to have so certain stores stay around and stay relevant. Same with music stores that started expanding into general electronics. Um, you got to change with the times. So if mom and pop shops aren't changing with the times and the only way they can get customers in is to illegally release games early, I'm sorry, I'm not going to feel bad for them that Nintendo's cracking down on that. In fact, the, the people I'm going to feel bad for are the customers that don't get their copies on release day now because they ordered it from an online place and now the online isn't getting the shipments in time to send it out for you to get it day one. Because it's good. What, it, what this is really going to hurt are the people that want it day one, but now the shipment might not be there on day one because it might be a day late. Because um, that happens. So that's why Nintendo was sending out the shipments as early as they were in the first place. So stores could have all the games day one, but if they're going to abuse that, then Nintendo's just not going to let that happen anymore. I mean, it, it, you have to understand both sides of the coin. I understand the mom and pop side. I understand Nintendo's side. There's a better way for both companies to handle it. But really, games just shouldn't be releasing early. You are risking legal action by doing that. Um, obviously, Nintendo, instead of in lieu of legal action, they are just saying, look, we're just not going to send your copies out until way closer to release. So you can't release it early. I don't know. I guess I don't have a problem with that. The last comment we're going to talk about this week uh, comes from the Switch has been hacked again, this time for full homebrew support. This is by far our most popular video from this past week, well over 7,000 views. Uh, and this comes from Real One Gaming. He said, this is bad, very bad even. It's too early in the system's life. They will probably find a way to circumvent the OS requirements too. Just a matter of time until you can play pirated Switch games. 
And if that happens too early, it could potentially kill the Switch like it did the Dreamcast and PSP. Now, I responded to this comment and it kind of went on this really long chain of comments. I, I wasn't, I, I didn't really say more beyond my one little response. But for starters, the Dreamcast didn't die because of piracy. Um, the Dreamcast was basically dead before it launched, not because the system was bad. The system actually sold very well, very well, and the games sold very, very well. What killed the system was that Sega was so in debt when they launched the Dreamcast that it didn't matter how well the Dreamcast performed, because factually, the Dreamcast actually performed very, very well for the nine months it was on the market. It's that Sega was so in debt that it was too late. Dreamcast was too late. Um, if they had not released all these other prior systems, just rolled out the Genesis and Saturn until the Dreamcast, they would have been fine. But they didn't. They released so many consoles in between that it just tanked their their stock. It tanked their profits. It got to the point where they felt the only way they could recover is to stop investing in hardware and just go third party. And that saved them. And it did well. And it ended up being the right choice for them. But yeah, the Dreamcast itself wasn't even a failure. Um, it, it's a common misconception that the Dreamcast killed Sega. The Dreamcast didn't kill Sega. The Dreamcast was amazing. Not just like from a personal opinion standpoint, because I love the Dreamcast, uh, just from a factual standpoint. It was selling well. The games were selling well. It had a lot of really, really good games, but it didn't matter because it was, it was too late. Too little, too late. Uh, the PSP, that's very interesting when people talk about how, uh, you know, you say here, uh, that it, that piracy and stuff like that killed the PSP. Did it kill the P The PSP sold 80 million units. Uh, Sony made profit on most of those 80 million units worth of sales. Uh, so Sony made a profit off of, off of piracy. If you're saying that piracy is why it sold 80 million. And it sold so well that they released a sequel to it in the Vita. So if it killed the PSP, then why did the Vita exist? It, it didn't really kill the PSP. What you can say it did is hurt game sales for some games, but there's a lot of evidence that shows that game sales actually grew from piracy. I know there's evidence as well you can point to that say that, that game sales sank from piracy. Reality is no one really knows how impactful piracy is on the industry. We do know that Nintendo's biggest issue with piracy, they, they say it's like the greatest threat facing modern technology today. Uh, maybe it's a gross exaggeration there, but I feel like uh, Nintendo's more worried about games leaking on the internet uh, and having all the stories and all the characters and all that stuff end up leaking uh, than they are about people actually playing the game early and pirating it. But piracy ultimately helps lead to these leaks. And obviously, Nintendo fought like this big court case over flash carts because that was a popular way people were pirating DS games. And it's going to happen on Switch. People are going to pirate Switch games someday. And Homebrew is like the first step to pirating Switch games. Uh, now, Homebrew, I, I, you know, as people noted, I kept talking a lot about piracy and emulation and blah, blah, blah. Uh, homebrew does more than that. Like, Homebrew itself isn't technically illegal. It's a modification to your Switch. It does void your warranty because it violates the terms of service. But violating the terms of service in this way... Uh, isn't actually illegal. It's just it, it voids any potential warranty possibility, both from the retailer and from Nintendo themselves. And that's on you if you want to do that. Just like if you open up your system, like if you take an iFixit kick and you open up your Switch, uh, you avoided your warranty. Uh, in fact, there's a seal, little seal sticker you're going to have to break in order to void your, or in order to avoid your warranty, and that's going to ensure that your warranty is voided. Now, some people have used little heat gun tricks to take that sticker off and then reapply it and try to trick people. I don't know why you would even want to do that, um, unless you're just curious about what it looks like inside your system. But then, like, there's a lot of places like Spawn Wave out there that will break down the system anyways, so you're you don't need to actually do that if you're just curious what it looks like. Um, but yeah, anyways, uh, the point being here in all of this is that I don't, this isn't going to kill Switch, right? Especially since this only works with firmware 3.0.0. And even once everything gets hacked and they're able to uh, play, you know, pirate games there, there's still, Nintendo kind of still has a form of DRM in that a lot of games require certain system updates 
And as long as Nintendo keeps patching the holes that are allowing homebrew in every single version, like as soon as people are able to get homebrew working in version 4.0.1, uh, Nintendo's probably going to have version 5.0 plus out there. And that's not going to, that's going to close that loophole. And all new Switch games from that point forward are going to require 5.0, whatever. Uh, so Nintendo's already combating all this. I, I don't really think that it, it, it's different today because. What Nintendo, I think, learned from the past with the Wii and DS and even the 3DS all being platforms that were easily hackable is that Nintendo lacks the competency to patch up these holes on their own faster than people are able to hack them. So instead, what Nintendo has done, and it's very interesting and it's already worked, uh, is they now offer $10,000 uh, to hackers who help Nintendo... Um, discover the exploits. So if a hacker, say someone like, oh, I got homebrew working on 3.0, but then I'm going to turn around and tell Nintendo how I did it. Um, so Nintendo patches it in a future update, which it's already been patched. That's why it doesn't work in 4.0.1. Uh, but that's the point. Hackers are now being paid by Nintendo to basically hack the system and find the exploits. Um, and through that, because hackers would rather get money than not make money, uh, I think we all would rather make money. Like, oh man, I hacked the Switch. Sweet, Nintendo will pay me for doing that. Um, yeah, I, I feel like Nintendo, uh, because of that, is always now going to stay ahead of the game. Obviously, this isn't going to stop people from using Homebrew that really, really want to use it. Uh, you know, they'll buy specific systems that have specific, you know, you know, OS versions to use it, and that's fine. You know, you can change your backgrounds and back up your game saves, which is a big deal right now since game saves have no other way to be backed up at the moment. But yeah, I, it's it's just a very interesting situation. Um, I'm personally not someone who uses Homebrew anymore. I did use it on the Wii. Uh, then I decided against using it because I found myself doing things with it that I wasn't okay with morally. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to judge you if you decide to use it that way. Uh, I know in the comments on this video it might felt like I was extremely judgmental, but I was just stating facts of, of how I feel about things. I'm, I'm not going to judge anybody. If you want to pirate games on your Switch, I'm not going to judge you for it. If you want to uh, emulate games, I'm not going to judge you for it. Whether or not you own these games or you don't own these games, you created these versions of the games yourself or you downloaded them. Uh, the facts are, you know, that there is like a strict line that this is illegal and pretty much everything else falls in the gray area. And I personally just don't believe in... Um, that those kind of modifications to, to systems anymore. Uh, there are specific hardware out there like Raspberry PIs that are specifically built for this kind of stuff. Uh, Switch is not meant as a platform to be modified and hacked in this way. So I, I just don't believe in it, uh, especially since a lot of people are going to use it for questionable activities. Uh, but again, Nintendo's already ahead of the game on Homebrew, even though it works on a specific version. But it, let's say that you have that specific version of the OS. Guess what? You can't play Super Mario Odyssey because it requires a newer version. So I'm going to guess that that's going to deter a lot of people from using Homebrew in the first place. Um, yeah. And really, uh, for people who want to use the system just for Homebrew and, and don't care about the Switch games, um, this is going to help sales of the Switch, not hurt it. So, Yeah. Anyways, see, I only took three questions. I meant to condense this video, and it got longer than I planned. This is what happens when there's a lot of passionate comments out there, passionate videos. Uh, we didn't have as many videos this week, but we had a lot of well-performing videos. I want to thank all of you guys for tuning in and caring about the topics talked about. I feel like it's more important for me to choose topics that I care about and that I think you guys are going to care about to talk about and report on at our channel than necessarily busting out three to four videos a day. Although I would like to break out three to four videos a day if there's enough topics I want to cover. Anyways, folks, I am Nathaniel Ruffledance from Nintendo Prime. And if you like this video, you know what to do. And if you dislike the video, hit that dislike button. Subscribe for more content. And I will catch you guys in the next one.